Bibles here. It's on page 65 where we're at. And we're looking at rules, and we were looking last week at rules and regulations, which is on the beginning part of this tape. And, you know, when you, when you look at these types of things, they look very cut and dry. Um, but, of course, if these rules and regulations were to be taken literally, then it, it has no purpose in your life because, obviously, the culture and so forth, these things are meaningless. They, they have no relevance. But the point is, how do we get to say, you don't take this literally, that these things have a deep occult meaning. These are not rules and regulations governing the social norms or the way people interact with one another. These are universal things. These are cosmic things. Just how does the, the mind interact? How do the thoughts of the mind interact? And is this what this is talking about? If you look on page 65 in Exodus chapter 21, and you look at verse... Um, well, between 15 and 25, the theme is an eye for an eye. In other words, somebody hurt somebody's eye, they hurt his eye. Somebody kills somebody, they kill him. Somebody knocks somebody's tooth out, they knock his tooth. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But basically what we're going to look at here is this has nothing to do with retribution from a standpoint of... Um, where we're at from a spiritual standpoint. It has nothing to do whatsoever because this is portrayed as a social norm when actually what's being talked about here is what we know as karma. An eye for an eye is karma. The result that what you do has to be undone. What you create comes back. The reason that you've experienced the things that you experience now are because of the things that have been put in motion into your life. Whether you're responsible for doing it or not, there's a result. Uh, Buddha put it this way, for every action, there is a cause. For every result, there is a cause. There is a, you reap what you sow, that kind of stuff. Basically, that's what's being discussed here. Otherwise, it's meaningless for us because uh, we might as well take it and rip it out and say, well, it has no, it has no place in our studies at all. It means nothing. Um, it, but it's not really reasonable just for me to stand here and tell you that. There has to be some kind of documentation that says, well, you're right. We, 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 can, we, can, um, we can look at this not in such a way as... Uh, literalism, but we can look at it spiritually. And how can, how can we arrive at that kind of confidence? Well, the Bible that we're at in the, in, in the, the book of Exodus and Leviticus and those places, the books of the law, um, dwells very deeply on the idea of sacrifice of animals. And sacrificing an animal, if we look in the Bible, it was a very, very important thing. But is that literal? If you look in the Bible, it literally says you sacrifice an animal. Okay. Well, that, again, would make it irrelevant for us because, you know, we're not into that kind of stuff. We don't do that. that doesn't, that's not done anymore. But why isn't it done? Well, we can say, well, our social, it doesn't, you know, it's disgusting and so forth. Well, certainly it is. But the point is, by looking at the Bible itself, hello, welcome to the snow, snow, snow. By looking at the Bible itself, we can understand that sacrificing an animal is not what's being referred to. If the Bible says you must sacrifice an animal to please God, then, uh, I'm not sure exactly what page it's on. If, if you have one, just go to Psalm chapter 40. Tell me what page that's on. And uh, take a look at that. Psalm chapter 40. What page is that on in those little Bibles? Do you have Okay, page 483, and in Psalm chapter 40, look at verse 6. Here's the statement that sacrifice and offering you do not desire. My ears have you opened. In other words, oh, I understand what you're talking about. You're not talking about killing a four-legged animal that walks out in a pasture. You're talking about killing the no-legged animal that walks through my head. You're talking about sacrificing animal instincts, which is the product of the lower mind. Sacrifice and offering you did not desire. Now, that gives us a little uh, 
confirmation that we can go ahead and say, well, all right, then let's look at these things symbolically and not literally. Because here, now the whole early part of the Bible talks about sacrificing animals, but now it comes up and says, well, that's not what we're talking about. Okay, that's one, and that isn't, we shouldn't just stop there. Let's look at one more. Uh, if somebody could just tell me, find the book of Isaiah, open to Isaiah in the very first chapter of Isaiah, and uh, just tell me what page that's on. 579. 579. Okay, look at page 579. The book of Isaiah, verse, chapter 1, look at verse 11. What purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices? I'm full of burnt offerings of rams and beasts. And I don't delight in the blood of bulls or lambs or goats. Verse 11, here's, a, here's the second statement in the Bible that sacrificing animal is not what is necessary. So, but then why is it in there? Because it's symbolic. The animal instincts are the thoughts of the lower mind, and you sacrifice those in meditation. What those animals are are thoughts. And how do you sacrifice them? By separating from thoughts and meditation. All the things that the doctors and the psychiatrists and the physiologists and all of these places, even the hospitals are finding out, the thoughts are a culprit. Thoughts are a culprit as far as our health is concerned. Thoughts are a culprit as far as our interaction with other people is concerned. So you sacrifice the thoughts, and when you sacrifice the thoughts, you're sacrificing the animal. But what is the most amazing and most wonderful thing we see of animal sacrifice that we can actually see for ourselves? Okay. You have constellations like they were talking about this morning, and the constellation, uh, which is the, the, the ram or the lamb, is Aries. Now, Aries is, is the lamb. Now, that, that's a sacrifice. Now, what is the sacrifice? The sacrifice, according to the Old Testament, is the burnt offering. Now, how is the burnt offering going to take place so that all of the wonders and all of the beautiful things happen? The sun is the fire, and when the sun comes up, it consumes Aries. What happens? Spring. All of that which was cold, all of that which was dark, all of that which was depressing gives way to that which is new. Why? Because there's a burnt offering. How? The fire consumed the lamb, you see. And what do you do then? It's the same thing which you see in the Old Testament. When the fire consumes the lamb, what happens? Passover. You pass over from the winter to the spring. And then the sun moves to the right side and you have summertime. But you can't have summertime and you can't have spring unless there's a burnt offering, unless the fire consumes the lamb. So then we, okay, so now we're seeing what the animal sacrifice really is. Now, in your body, what is Aries? Pineal gland. Pineal gland. In your body, what is the sun? The solar plexus. So the energy from the solar plexus rises up consumes the pineal gland, throws open the right side, and you pass over from the cold and dark winter of your life to the spring and summer of your life. Behold, all things become new. That's what this is all about. It has nothing to do with killing animals. It has nothing to do with knocking somebody's eye out and they're going to knock your eye out. It's talking about the retribution that comes as a result of action, the retribution that comes as a result of thought. Many times when we get into a situation where we start thinking of things, these things happen. Why? Not because there's some kind of hocus pocus going on, but because these things have a way of acting themselves out in our lives. So we look at this in, in Exodus 21 verses 15 to 25, and we're looking at an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. One of the interesting things in the Ten Commandments is where it says, honor your father and your mother. If you remember when we, when, we, when we talked about that? But then we found out that Jesus says, call no man on this earth your father. So then we found out, well, we're not talking about a father and mother who live in your house. We're talking about mind, father, and spirit, mother. So understanding that then and realizing that we saw two instances in Isaiah and the book of Psalms in which it says that animal sacrifice was not meant literally. 
We understand that the, the sacrifice of the lamb is, a, is, a, is an astrological, cosmological event. It has nothing to do with killing a, a real animal. And then we understand even in the Ten Commandments that father and mother are talking about mind and spirit and not talking about actual mothers and fathers who live with children in homes and so forth and so on. Once we understand that, then you can go into looking at eye for eye, tooth for tooth, and all this kind of business and start saying, what the heck is it talking about? Look at uh, 2115. Excuse me, look at page 65, Exodus 21, and verse 15. Page 60, 65, Exodus chapter 21, and verse 15. And it says, he that smites, that word smite means hits. He that hits his mother or his father shall be put to death. Okay. Now, you know, we, we just got done studying the Ten Commandments a few weeks ago, which it says, thou shalt not kill. And then you can get 30,000 variations of how you can kill people. All right, here, here we have... You're going to kill somebody if they hit their father or their mother. And we understand from Jesus that you're not to call anybody on this earth your father. So we know we're talking about a mystical father or a mystical mother. You're talking about your mind. You're talking about your spirit. And what's being said here is if you come against your mind, if you come against your mind spiritually, you come against your spirit spiritually, either by thought or deed, you're going to have an inner death. You're going to have a struggle with life. You're not going to be able to experience life. So you've got to protect father. You've got to protect your mind. You've got to protect mother. You've got to protect your spirit. You've got to lift and honor your father, which is your mind. You've got to lift and honor your mother, which is your spirit. And then you don't go through this particular thing, which the Bible labels as death, which is actually the falling down of our life experience. So, 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 so then, then we have a situation here where you say, gee, you know, okay, th this has some relevance in my life, you know, because um, you're not going to go around hitting your mother or father, and if you did, I mean, you don't want somebody killing you over it. But now you can understand, if I come against my mind, if I come against my spirit, i got a problem. And that problem is, is death as far as my experience and understanding what, what purpose of life is. Look at 21.16. He that steals a man and sells him, if he's found... He'll should be put to death. Well, yeah. Again, something totally irrelevant for us. Stealing a man. What's it? Now, what is man? Man is mind. Man is mind. Woman is emotions. Man is, uh, is mind. God, woman is spirit. But here we're talking about stealing the mind and selling it. So how does that, how do, how, how do, how do we... What steals spirit and truth from the mind and then sells the very thing it stole? Religion. Religion takes away from you the very, very truth of the existence of life, takes it away, and then tries to, to give it back to you for a price. Sells it to you. When this is all free. The very truth that's involved in your mind, the very truth that is involved in your spirit, there's no price tag on it. But what do they do? They take this stuff, they dress it up in some kind of a, a, a fictitious type of narrative, and they create stories about it. We've got a Jesus who gets killed, we've got a Mary who's a virgin, we've got all these bizarre stories, and they turn around and they say, they're going to pass the back, we're going to sell you these things, and it's a lot. So what has happened is they've stolen the truth and they're coming back and selling this thing as a, as a lie and we go on, for the most part, we buy it. Look at 21.17. He that curses his father or mother shall be put to death. Cursing is coming against yourself. Cursing the father, cursing the mother is coming against your spirit and your mind. You come against yourself. You don't have any... Con you don't have any and any idea of, of who you are, you have no idea of, of, of the tremendous potential within yourself because of your whole life you spent being put down. Religion has put you down, the system has put you down, families have put you down, bosses have put you down, and so you get to the point where, hey, you know, I, I, I'm worthless. And so we give up our entire life in order to, to come and sit in these churches and, and listen to people tell us how rotten we are and how no good we are. So the curse of mind or spirit is a blasphemy. And once one turns their mind and their spirit into the dwelling place of all of these ideas and these thoughts and so forth and so on, then we're occupied with, with what you'd call demons. Demons are thoughts, and they cause a lot of problems in our life. 
And, the, and, and all of this stuff goes on to verse 24 and 25, the retribution of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth and all of that stuff. But let's take a look at that and let's look at it more or less spiritually. An eye for an eye. As I said, what that's talking about is karma. And what that means is whatever you take out, you've got to put back. Whatever mischief you have done, it's going to have to be undone. It doesn't make any difference whether, you know, you're content with your life or whatever. It's a problem for you. And it becomes a problem somewhere down the road, something happens in your life. Somewhere down the road, something happens to discourage you. Somewhere down the road, something happens to cause you a sickness. But there's always a cause. There, you can always trace it back. Somewhere down the road, you could stop and say, why did this happen? And you'll always be able to trace it back to an event. And it's not necessarily an event that you're responsible for, but nonetheless, it's an event. It could be an idea that somebody put into your head. It could be an idea or, 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 a, or a fear that somebody put into you. It will come up and it will hurt. And the only possible way on the face of this earth to overwhelm and overcome this is through meditation. There is no other way. There is no other way to clean the mind out. There is no other way to chase those things away. So you've got to learn, and I've got to learn, even what we think brings a price. The law of cause and effect is, is it's, it's a law. I mean, there's a very good chance that if you smoke, you're going to get lung cancer. There's a very good chance that if you don't, you're not. It's a law of cause and effect. And you can apply that in a million ways. Lung cancer from smoking a cigarette is an eye for an eye. It's what it is. It's, it's, <laughs> there's going to be a negative result of a negative act. There's going to be a negative result of a negative thought. You say, well, how? I can't help but think of negatives. I understand that. But you can meditate. You can spend time in meditation where the thoughts are flushed away. You can spend time in meditation where that inner is purified by this new energy. <sighs> at, at Exodus 21, uh, verses 26 to 36, is again cosmic law. And there's many variations uh, of, of the intent in, 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 in these as you unravel these words, you see things, and I think now we spent a few minutes talking about how the symbolisms work. This will probably be somewhat easy for you. But look at Exodus 21, and look at verse 28. If an ox gores a man or a woman that they should die, then the ox shall surely be stoned, and his flesh shall not be eaten. Now, what you have to understand is this stuff is written by mystical people from the East. This stuff is written by people who dwell in cosmology. This stuff is written by people who dwell in the desert and were deep mystical people. People of the... And so when you look at this, you talk about an ox. What is it? How many of you that are watching this, how many of you sitting here own an ox? Nobody owns an ox. So, I mean, it's irrelevant. Why is it even... What, why bother with this stuff? Because it's very, very important. Once you understand, like we've been taught, remember what, what, what it said in the Bible in Psalms? You didn't mean to, for me to kill an animal. Oh, I understand that. And it's, why are you doing this? Who told you to do this? See? So now we're talking about an ox. See? And we're talking about a very, very important part of cosmology. And when you get into talking about, uh, uh, you, you, you talk about an ox, you go right back to what? To that part of time that existed before the Bible, astrology. Which scares the hell out of people. But nonetheless, it's true. Astrology would have existed before the Bible. And so what are you talking about? Taurus. The bull. That's what you're talking about. Look, if you can, real quick, just find the book of Job and tell me what page Job 32 is on. It, it's, it's right before the book of Psalms. Okay. Boy, wow, good. Job 32, page 454. Let me show you something. Uh, I might have the, uh, I might have the wrong one. I thought it was Job 32. Wait a minute, maybe, maybe it's Job 38. Yes, it is. It's Job 38. I'm sorry. Job 38. What page is that on? 458. 458. Okay, look at Job chapter 38. Now look at verse 31. 
Or what does it say? Can you bind the sweet influence of Pleiades? It's an influence. Can you loose the bands of Orion? Can you bring forth Maseroth? You know what Maseroth means? The 12 signs of the zodiac. <coughs> or can you guide Arcturus? Arcturus is a mighty constellation. But this is what I want you to see. What you're looking at is the oldest book known to man. It's the book of Job. It's an oriental book. Thousands, 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 thousands of years old. But what does it do? It talks about something that existed before it. Astrology. It talks about Pleiades and Orion. Pleiades and Orion astrology could not have come after the Bible or it couldn't have talked about it. It came before the Bible and the Bible's quoting Pleiades and Orion, which means that astrology was there before the Bible was. In other words, this, uh, these things were written in the stars long before anybody ever sat down and read a Bible, write a Bible, and the book of Job is the oldest book in the Bible. And yet astrology existed before that. And so when you see this, in Exodus 21, verse 28, back on page 65, you see, if an ox gore a man, what are we looking at? Start to think about it. What is Taurus? What is the ox? Okay. It is the power of the flesh, the power of the lower mind. The power of the lower mind gores a man or woman, hurts the mind or spirit. Okay. Then, that ox will have to be stoned. What's the stone? The pineal gland. This happens inside of you. It is the power of your lower mind, your ego, which destroys your mind, destroys your spirit, and when you find that happening, then that ox, that power must be stoned. The stone that the builders rejected is the pineal stone, the pineal gland of the brain. So then you have to go, in other words, the power of the flesh must be consumed in the pineal gland. It's the third eye, it's the single eye, it's that Jesus said, if your eye be single, your body will fill with light. So if there is power within you, and that power within you is disturbing your mind and spirit, then it must be overcome by the pineal gland, the stone that the builders of... Uh, see, the <laughs> pineal is interesting. When it is in an unregenerated state, and it's not awake, it's not doing anything, it is a sandy consistency, and Jesus says, people who build their house on sand, when the storm comes, it's swept out to sea. When you meditate, the pineal gland becomes like a little stone, and Jesus says, he who builds his house on stone, when the storm comes, that house will stand. And so the stone that the builders, have reje uh, the stone that the builders rejected is the pineal stone. That is the stone that stones to death the power of the ox or the power of the lower mind that comes against your mind and spirit. Otherwise, the Bible is silly, it's stupid, it has no relevance, it, even, it shouldn't even be a, you know, it's a waste. But it's not a waste. It's metaphysical psychology. It is written in deep symbolisms, and it requires just a minute bit of concentration and understanding to say, what is ox? What is bull? It is power. Power of what? The power of the flesh. The power of the lower ego, and it hurts the mind, and it hurts the spirit. Well, what do I do when I have that power inside of me? I've got to get into meditation and activate the pineal, and that becomes the stone that destroys that power which destroys us. Now, there's an interesting point here. It says that the flesh of the ox shall not be eaten. And what's being said is, it's a portrayal as communion. This flesh is powerful and wild and does harm, and it must not be taken inwardly. This flesh is powerful, it must not be taken inwardly. The only thing you should take inwardly is through your meditation through the pineal. Because what you're taking inwardly that is part of, of the mind is, of, what is, what am I talking about the power? It's right, while you're sitting here watching me, while you're sitting here watching television, whatever it may be, inside of your mind there is something going on. There are thoughts, and some of them can be very difficult and can be very frightening to you. It's the ox. The ox is wild. You ever see a raging bull, you know, with snorting and pawing at the ground, ready to kill anything that gets in its way? That's what it's... But forget about it as an animal. Think about it in your head. When that ox, that bull inside of you starts to rage, and then you go, and what, is it, what does it cause you to do? It demonstrates outside exactly what's inside. Think of a raging bull... Now put it inside of your head and then look at yourself sometime when you lose control. And we all do. But what the Bible is saying, that has got to be stoned and you stone that 
by the pineal gland. And you should not consume it. Well, we all consume the thoughts, but what it's saying here is that what we should be consuming are the thoughts that come through us in meditation. So, now, so then what are we talking about here? It says you shouldn't eat the flesh of the ox. Now you're saying, well, you know, yeah. I'm saying what it's talking about is you should not take into you the flesh and blood of that which is the lower ego, the lower mind, which causes your problems. People are laying in hospitals all over the place. People are in jail all over the place because they've eaten the flesh of that, that ox. They've consumed the power of the lower mind and it's destroying them. And it says don't do that. Now how can I show you that that's what it means, that it's not talking about eating a real animal? Let me show you. Go to page 870. And then look at the book of John. And in the book of John, look at John chapter 6. And in John chapter 6, look at verse 53. Here's Jesus saying, this is a condition for you to have life. What is his condition? I say unto you, except that you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Take it literally. I want the fundamentalist to take that literally. This guy says, unless you go up, take a bite out of him and suck the blood out of his arm, you're not going to have any life. But you say, well, that's ridiculous. Certainly it's ridiculous. That's why you shouldn't take the Bible literally. But you just can't say, well, I'm not going to take that part literally, but I'm going to take this part literally. You don't take any of it literally. And it also means you don't walk up to a bull and bite the bull and suck the blood out of the bull. You're talking about, you're talking about a metaphysical thing. You're talking about a spiritual thing. And so when Jesus is saying, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and unless you drink his blood, you can have no life. Fine. What is flesh? What is it? Flesh, bread, is knowledge. Okay? Bread of life and so forth. Uh, blood, wine, is spirit. So, the Son of Man, that which is within you, the Christ consciousness within you, unless you have the understanding and unless you have the spirit, you don't have any life in you. So, that, what do they say? Unless you eat the flesh and drink the blood. Which is ghastly, obviously. But it's not talking about that. So, what do we have? Do you see anything? You have communion. So, what do they do? They drink wine or grape juice and they eat wafers. And where does that go? Eventually... You know where it goes. So it has, what's relevant to it? There's no relevance. It's in your stomach. What's it doing there? Acid eats it. So that's not obviously what it's talking about. Where does this come from? Eating the f bread and wine, eating the flesh and blood. I'll tell you where it comes from. It initially started thousands of years ago as cannibalism. And what they would do is they'd take the hot shot of the tribe, whoever was the smartest person. It, in those days it paid to be a fakakta. It paid to be a dummy and stupid and sit out in the bushes. So I don't know nothing. I don't want to know. Because if you were real smart, they killed you and they ate you. And the reason they did that is they figured if we eat this guy, we'll be as smart as him. And that's what they did. And so, as the culture started to spread, you came to the culture in Egypt of Osiris. And civilization through the Egyptian culture came, and Osiris then was the god who came up and resurrected into the earth as wheat. So they took the wheat, and out of the wheat they made bread, and out of the barley they made beer. And they would drink the bread, uh, drink the beer, and eat the bread, and that would be the communion. When the culture moved out of uh, uh, Egypt to Greece, you, the god there was Dionysius. Dionysius was the god of wine, was the wine god. So now we're not any longer bread and beer, it became bread and wine. And that's where it came from. But to this day, there are people filled with this uh, uh, idea that if they actually put into their stomach a wafer and some grape juice, that, and it's ridiculous, they miss the whole thing. What it's talking about is what? You must put in the spirit, which comes from meditation. There's no other way you can get it in. You must put in the knowledge, which comes from understanding the symbolisms of these teachings. Other than that, you're dead. Because there's a lot of people that meditate, and they have no idea what they're going They have no idea what's going on. No idea what, why do I feel this way? Why do I think this way? I had something happen here, and I, and I was, one thing I, I disappointed about the snow. I had a fellow come up last Sunday, and he comes here all the time. 
And after the sermon started, he came up here and he sat next to me. And just, we just sat here and he says, you know, I feel it. I sense it. I know something's happening. I know something's going on. He said, I feel like a deer sniffing in the woods that something's happening. And I said to him, of all the things I've asked people, of all the things I've taught people, that's the only thing I'm waiting for somebody to tell me. And that's, he's the first one to do it. I just wanted somebody to tell me that they sense the change. They sense the change everywhere. I mean, <laughs> you've seen it happen all over the world. Governments are crashing down. People are making peace with each other that have been <laughs> killing each other for all of these years. Things are just changing all over the place. This government in the United States, you're watching a revelation. You're watching an Aquarian revelation happen. You, the, the government was shut down here. There's a revolution. It has nothing to do with Republicans or Democrats. The whole mindset is being changed by the angles of these electromagnetic fields. And all of this thing is in an upheaval. All of this thing is in turmoil. Okay? And this turmoil is basically what you're going to see. You see it in your family. Think what's going on in your family. What kind of turmoil is there in your family? You see it in the weather. The worst storm. What kind of turmoil is there? And it's all caused by what? Something called Uranus. Something called Uranus. And people don't understand the power of this thing. And all I can do is tell you. It's spinning in the opposite direction of every other planet in the galaxy. And it is in control of the activities on Earth right now. And it's raising hell. It just turns everything upside down. And what Uranus is, Uranus is like a mighty wave in the ocean. You've got two choices. You can take your surfboard, watch for that wave, get on top of it and ride it. Or you can face the opposite direction and it'll knock you right on your keister. Flatten you. But see, you got under people don't understand this. It's like Dr. this guy Kennedy from Fort Lauderdale. He's starting to talk about the Zodiac. Well, that's great. But he still doesn't understand what you have to start flowing in harmony. How do you get into harmony with Uranus? You either meditate or you're not going to get in harmony. And it'll clobber you. Here, 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 you have, here you have all of the planets in the universe going that way. And we got used to that. Now all of a sudden the one that's controlling the shots is going that way. And we're still trying to, oh, everything is, it's not business like normal, it's going to get worse, or better. I think it's going to get better. Look well, what we saw in 1995. Two, two things that in this place, in this church, and only in this place, and you know that, and I'm not throwing a lot of stuff. Two things. What, what did we talk about seven, eight, nine years ago? Pineal gland and melatonin. Now, now all of a sudden, 1995, you see ads on TV. Come to CVS Drugstore New York, your melatonin headquarters. They're selling it all over the place. So, you know, I feel real justified. The entire world knows about melatonin, but you people that have been coming here and have heard this know that the first place it was ever mentioned here was here about eight years ago. What, in what context? The pineal gland being the single eye, melatonin being the hormone which is secreted by it, and, Jesus, and it's a skin lightener. And Jesus saying, if your eye be single, pineal, your body will fill with light, melatonin. And so that became, and now what's the second thing that happened in 1995? Pegasus, the white horse. Which we've been trying, and in the entire month of February here, four weeks, and, and we're putting a tremendous ad, and it's going to be an insert in the Asbury Park Press, <laughs> color ad, the whole thing, about the thing we're going to be doing with Pegasus in February. Pegasus the sign, Pegasus the star, Pegasus the meaning, Pegasus the discovery. Here is, Jesus is the sun star. He is the sun star. The first one, the star of which the earth circles around. The star which the twelve signs circle around. The sun star, Jesus. The second coming is what? The time that they find another sun star just like this one. They found another sun star just like this one three months ago. And where was it? Right where the Bible said it would be. He will come on a white horse. Right in the middle of Pegasus, the white horse, they found a sun star with a planet circling around it just like this one, the first time in the history of the world. So the second coming is taking place in Pegasus. And what does it mean in 1996? This is what it means. The number seven means intervention in your life. And if you add up 1996, 10, 19, 25, it comes out to seven. It's going to be a fantastic year. The pineal and, and melatonin and, and, and Pegasus. But, you know, the, the Pegasus story is just being written. You know what's interesting? For those of you that... And, and it also says about Jesus coming back on the white horse, it says, and he is followed by thousands of angels on white horses. And when the scientists found Pegasus, 
the scientists in Switzerland, then confirmed by the American scientists, they said, there are thousands of stars f coming towards the Earth through Pegasus. It says they look like bees swarming around a hive. And then one of the scientists says, they seem to be controlled by a giant central object. Wow. It's, I mean, it's amazing stuff. So that's what we're looking forward. And you keep your eye on the astrology, astronomy, as it involves Pegasus, and amazing things are going to happen this year. So we see that the flesh of the ox. So I have a question. Well, but, all right, hold, but you've got to get up because it's on. Okay, but now, um, you can turn around so that. Uh, okay, but now if you don't meditate, mm -hmm. all right, mm -hmm. then what? Okay. If you, let's say, for instance, we have a, we have a big snowstorm today. All right. If you go out into the big snowstorm today with your bikini on, you're going to freeze to death. Not because there's anybody or any god out there that's saying, I'm going to send snow to freeze. What you've got to do is realize this is the nature of the season. This is the nature of what's going on. I've got to flow in harmony with it. I've got to wear my boots. I've got to dress warmly. I've got to prepare to acclimate myself to the situation that's going on there. Okay, has nothing to do with any intent to hurt anybody. If you meditate, this is what happens. Let's, let's, let, it's a good question. But let's, let's take it first in, in the, uh, the way an animal, okay? Let's take an animal. Let's take a bird, all right? This is, uh, say, a Canadian goose. This goose is a goose. It doesn't know from nothing. But it has a pineal gland. It has an active pineal gland. Coming down from here are the instructions. Beep, 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 The goose is over here doing what gooses do. But it gets to be a time in an animal, it turns automatically. The antenna in the goose turns automatically and shifts and connects with the message. Now when that connects, this goose says, I'm not going to fly around here. No, I've got to get out of here. No choice. The goose takes off. It's gone. Why? Because it's got the instructions. It harmonized. Now you have this entire cosmic change going on in the universe today. And you have a pineal gland. I have a, everybody has a pineal gland. And the message is coming down boop, 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 through Uranus. But where is our antenna? Over here. I don't even know this is going on. And so all of the crap that's going to happen, we have no idea it's going to happen. It's like Larry King is on channel 50, 48, 46, whatever it is, 28. But my TV only goes up to 13. I can't see him. And he's giving out this important message. Oh, if I only had a television, what do I have to do? I have to hook up to the cable. I have to get it on a better antenna. I've got to get a TV that goes up to that frequency. I've got to change. Well, you don't have a TV in yet, but you have meditation. And what you do when you meditate, you... As the, as, the, as the antenna turns automatically for the goose, the antenna turns by your meditation, and you and you get online and it instructs you what to do. What are you going to do? You don't just sit here and you can laugh at it, you can sit here, you can snarl at it, and say, why does God let this happen to me? No, he didn't let it happen to you. You didn't turn your antenna. You didn't pick up the message. You don't know what the hell's going on. Was it Rich Hay, who's a pilot for United Airlines, and whenever he can come here, Rich is a good supporter, and he communicates all the time. And Rich flies these great big 747 planes. And he says when he flies in the Kennedy Airport or any of these big airports, he can't see anything. He can't see nothing. He doesn't know where the safety is. But he knows one thing on his thing is that beacon. Boop, boop, boop. And he changes everything. Boop, boop. And, and when he gets in harmony with that radar, whatever it is, Rich says, right through the clouds, right in front of him is the runway. Who told him? He changed and he put himself into harmony with it. And that's where we're not in harmony. We don't know these signals that are coming down. And if it's not, it's, what it's saying is, this is what you've got to do. This is what you've got to do. This is what you've got to do. And we're not listening. It's like somebody saying, do you ever go down to the beach, there's a big wave, somebody, hey, look out, and you turn around, there's a big wave, and you duck or you dive into it or you fly. And this is saying, hey, look out, this is what you've got to do. But we're not listening, we're over here. And then 
you know, and if you don't meditate, you're not in harmony with it. it this is an elect, this is a thing, this has nothing to do with a God thing, a spirit thing, an evangelistic thing. It's, not, it's a lot of crap, all this religion. It has nothing to do with that. We're talking about a scientific electrical phenomena that happens. You have 12 seasons of the earth. January, February, March, April, May, June. You have 12 seasons of the universe. Sagittarius, can't, and they're all different. And you cannot live out here in February and January like you do in August. You wear your shorts in August. You can't wear your shorts in January. You do things differently in Pisces than you're going to do in Aquarius. You can't do it the same way. And that's what's trying. But you've got to... And if you don't go into meditation, your antenna's going this way, but the signal's coming from over here, and you don't hear it. And then you say, why did this happen? So you're listening. And that's what goes on. Okay? Now, what, what I wanted to just show you that the flesh of the ox we talked about a minute ago is an animal instinct that kills the mind. You don't consume that. But it's a natural thing. It's normal and natural. It doesn't have any reflection. It doesn't mean you wanted to hurt anybody. It doesn't mean you wanted anybody in your family to get hurt. But nobody ever told us this stuff before. You know, we've, we've been told to come to church and sing songs and read Bibles and it has none of this stuff in it because we don't understand it. Now I'm telling you this, so you begin to understand, okay, these things happened to you before, they don't have to continue to happen to you, because now you can connect yourself to that message. And did I say it? Jesus said it. Buddha said it. Krishna said it. Muhammad said it. Everybody said it. But we've got a culture here which is built around people afraid to take control of their lives, people afraid of everything that happened, and so they come like, like, sheep into a, in, right, into a place and they sit and somebody says, you're going to do this and you got to do that. And they, gotta, and they say, well, that's what I have to do. But now I'm telling you, in this Aquarian age, many people, most people, and I've written to 72 churches, fundamentalist churches, and told them about Pegasus. Most people have an astronomer. Even the astronomers who found this thing have no idea that it's talked about. He's, he's an astronomer looking up and he sees this thing. And Pegasus, he doesn't know that in the Bible it says, and the heavens opened, and behold, I saw a white horse. The second coming of the sun star. He doesn't know that. But you do, and I've told people this. This is the second coming. This, but what is it? Is it a guy that's going to come? No, there's no guy. That's, it's a second coming of this consciousness which overcomes all of the, of the troubles. And, and, and that's why it's important. But who knows it? If, if there's nobody here to tell you, how do you know it? And most people don't know it. They don't know. And so that's our job. Now, well, what it says in Exodus 21, and we'll get out of here in a few minutes. Exodus chapter 21 on page 65. And uh, in Exodus chapter 21, look at verse 28. It says, if an ox goes, if, verse 29, if the ox were wont to push with his horn in the time past, and it had been testified to his owner, and he hadn't kept him in, but he that killed the man of the ox shall be stoned, and the owner shall also be put to death. What's that saying? All right, let me tell you what it's saying. Let me tell you what it's saying. It's saying, if the ox was known to show tendencies in the past and you did nothing, you got a problem. You're neglecting the power of your own flesh, which is destructive. You didn't do anything about it. In other words, you knew these things were going on. You knew you felt this way. But you didn't do anything about it. You got a problem. You're going to get hurt. See? Now you're going to have to suggest, you're going to have to subject yourself to this stone, this pineal stone. Once it happens, you're put on notice. There's no guilt. No guilt originally because these things happen to everybody. Everybody. I mean, I've gone through my whole life. All kinds of kooky things happen. All kinds of trouble happen. Everybody has this thing. I get all of these thoughts and all of these feelings like everybody else. Everybody has this stuff. But once you start to realize, hey, this can be destructive to your health. This can be destructive to your life. This can be destructive to your family. Now you're put on notice. Once you're aware of the problem, even though you didn't cause it, now you're aware you should subject yourself to this meditation. If you choose not to, then you can't say this is it. If you choose not to and all hell breaks loose, say, uh, that's it. If I chose to go out today in a, in a bathing suit, that's suicide. Well, 
that's what I chose to do. But you've got to have, you've got, you've got to have that right to make that choice. If that's what you choose to do, that's what you choose to do. Do you think that there's going to be that you know the more turmoil to bring people to their knees to turn to another way? Yeah, but let me show you how it happens. We've seen it happen. Here you have a terrorist. Well, you, remember you had the terrorist Saul who became Paul, right? Here you got two terrorists right now. One of the terrorists just got killed. His name was Menachem Begin. He was a president of Israel. This guy was a terrorist against the Arabs. Okay, he became a nice guy. What happened to him? All of a sudden he's making peace. Well, who's he making peace with? Yasser Arafat. Get this. There's another terrorist. Two guys were butchers. They bloodletters. I mean, they were violent people. And they were just kissing each other. What is this all about? Why? Uranus. See, what you do, and the, and the cosmos understands it. I don't have to hit every Palestinian. I hit Yasser. You hit the shepherd in the sheep file. I hit Begin. So this is nice. We're going to have peace. We're going to have love. But there's people that aren't hit with this thing that don't understand that. There's a guy down here with a gun in his hand. All he knows is this is violating his traditions. This is making things uh, uh, the way he didn't, wasn't brought up. I mean, it's his traditional religious concept. So he kills this guy. Well, they didn't really kill him because you can't kill him. But he, he shoots him and he, he kills Begin because he couldn't deal with it. So it's an upheaval. It's a change. You see this country, you're going to see banks collapse. You're seeing these companies that are consolidating. Look, in a, in a judge, they laid off 40,000 people. 40,000 people are going to get laid off all over the place. And you're going to see it more and more. And more. Well, it's a terrible thing. And what is it? Why is it? It's, but these people don't know that they have to get in and harmonize so they know what to do. They don't have any idea. So it is chaos, but it's not chaos because anybody's deliberately doing anything. It's the season. It's chaos outside now. There's nobody deliberately doing anything. It's the season. You've got to understand that. You've got to be able to harmonize with it. You've got to be able to flow with nature, and they don't. And so when Uranus does all of these things to people, it's not only changed the, the environment by changing the weather, it's changing your mind. It's changing the way you think. And even though you may not be able to tell the closest person to you, and there's a couple of young people in here, maybe they will be square for them to tell somebody. Maybe uh, the kids at school, they say they're freaky. But it doesn't change the fact that inside their head when they lay down in their bed, they know this, they feel this way. They can't admit it to me. They can't admit it to their mothers and fathers. They can't admit it to anybody. But it's still inside their head. And they feel this way. And, and a lot of kids don't know what to do. They don't know what to think because they're feeling the same way. And who do they have to turn to? Who's there to explain to them what's going on? Ain't nobody. See? Because their parents were told by some guy in a pulpit who didn't have the faintest idea what was going on. And this has been going on and on and on. So then people are sent to try to wake people up and tell them. Well, like Debbie saw this morning, there's a guy on television who's a fundamentalist talking about Virgo and Scorpio and all. He's still a little off, but I mean, he's first step. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, you know, for, well, a few years ago, you get, you get killed for saying that. And all the things we say in here, if you take any of the fundamentalists to say about that, they'd kill them. So to answer the question, it said, yes, there's going to be upheavals, but those people who, what does it say? A thousand shall fall on your left and a thousand shall fall on your right, but no harm will come to you. Why? Because you're in harmony. It's like the guy, I'm not looking at the wave. I'm here frolicking on the beach. I'm getting myself wet. Here comes this humongous wave. I'm not looking. You're looking at it. You got your surfboard. You're on top. And as I'm tumbling head over heels in the sand, you're going by on your surfboard. Hey, hang ten. Well, why? Wow, this is beautiful. What's wrong? Well, you ever see these guys going out in Honolulu? You'd be scared to death. You went in the ocean, they'd kill you. They love it. Go get me a battery. They flow with it. Okay. Okay, we're almost done anyhow. So we realize that, you know, you have problems in your life, and nobody's saying it's your responsibility. And that's not a problem at all. Yeah. I'm going to shut the, the uh, no, I'm not talking to you, Lorraine. I'm, I'm going to shut the uh, mic off for a second. Okay. All right.
So there's a way to discern what is cosmic law. And how do you discern, if you're reading the Bible, or some of you taking notes, this is your number, nine. Number seven means divine intervention. Things are going to happen. 1996 adds up to seven. Number eight means rupture. <laughs> People are going to be separated from all the traditional things. There's going to be, like, religion is going to go right down the toilet. When's that going to happen in 1997? The number nine is the cosmic number of the mind, is 1998. Watch for that. Watch for that. And I tell you, you had guys like Mostradamus, knew this, talked about these same years, knew it. But what did he know? He knew cosmology. Big deal. He wasn't a prophet. He knew how to read the stars. And once you understand what the numbers mean, you can tell anybody, this one's going to happen. So, it's very simple. No big deal. So I said, boy, he's really, how did he know all this stuff? He just understood the basic principles of symbolism. Where do you get that? Huh? Where do you get that? Well, it's very simple. Well, yeah, all right, but, but let me tell you how, how simple it is to, to get that. Um, there are two things that are required. First of all, a desire to know, and second of all, uh, a desire and a, and a commitment to discipline yourself to meditation. Okay? Now, you're in here, you come in this place, and I say to you, you say to me, where, 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 where are you going to set this stuff? I say, okay, let me suggest a book to you. The book is called The Dictionary of Myth and Scripture by G. Gaskill. This guy spent his whole life translating all these symbolisms of the ancient religions, including Christianity and Judaism. That gives you a basic foundation. Then you go into meditation. Your meditation will start tuning you in and starts opening and expanding your enlightenment of these things. And before you know it, after you get a little guidance from Gaskell, you put the book down. You don't need it anymore. You don't need Gaskell to tell you that when somebody goes into a desert, it doesn't mean they're going into a desert with cactus bushes, bushes and sand. It means they're going into confusion. They don't know which way to turn. And you don't need, after a while, to understand that Gaskell's not going to tell you what 1 to 10 means. You'll understand what it means. And you know how to do this. And, and so then when you, when you see and you realize that number 9 is the number of the mind, and when you look and you see about the sign of the beast, and you see all the people carving out 666, you'll know that all I have to do is add it up, and it's me. Oh, but 144,000 are saved. Well, I also know that all I've got to do is add that up, and it's me. And so that you begin to understand, you begin to break the cosmic code. See? I mean, it's not hard for you. How simple it is for you. Let me show you how simple it is for you. I'm going to speak to you in cosmic code that you and I both understand. Yet we've never talked. We've never really met or discussed this. But yet you and I will know and you will understand the cosmic code I speak to you immediately. You will know that I am not speaking literally. You will know that I am speaking symbolically. That woman shot her mouth off. Did she use a gun? Oh. <laughs> right? Now, I want you and me to do something a little later. Let you and me shoot the ball. Do we have to get a gun? Do we have to find a big black animal with horns? The woman sitting in the middle here, she really spilled the beans. Do you need a broom? You know that. It's right on the nose. Oh, she's green with envy. She's three sheets to the wind. You speak these language all the time, and you know it. It's your language, and it's all symbolism. But you get somebody else from outside that doesn't know what you're talking about. What do you mean you're going to have a shower? Why are you inviting me to your shower? <laughs> and believe me, it's true. It's exactly what happened. We have people, we have people from France and, 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 and South America and different places, and they say, they don't understand that symbolism that we use, and we don't understand the symbolism that they use. This is a cosmic symbolism. And so when it talks about stoning a, an, an ox or all of these types of things, you, you realize, hey, it's the power of Taurus that has to be stoned. But your meditation is extremely important because you start honing in on, on this instruction. And then also, when you come into a place like this, I look you right in the eye and I say, I'll tell you a book to get, and you'll know. Just like that, you'll know. And there it is. But yes, uh, there are people out there that, uh, that don't know. But there's more and more that are. And you know, I'm, I'm here, but there's a, there's, there are other people. And, 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 and I, I never know from day to day what's going to happen. What's the next step 
of where we're going to be able to communicate. I was given some really exciting news about, you know, having a television outlet in New Jersey and Philadelphia, which will give us a million people to talk to um, at no expense. I mean, you know, these are all things that I have to, we have to just wait for, and they happen. So, but uh, it's like Pegasus. You, you come in here this morning through the snow, through the drifts of snow, and God knows what else out there, and you sat down and you heard it, and it might shock your socks. You, never, you probably didn't know that before about Pegasus. You probably didn't know that the second sun star had been discovered. Did you? No. no but you do now. Sure. The most monumental thing that could happen, that's the second coming of Christ, is now visible with a pair of binoculars. But you know what? You're one of the very, very few. But was it worth coming through the snow? No. And I'll, you know, if you write your name... And your address down in the back, I'll send you the, the newspaper articles and the Newsweek articles about the discovery of this sun star, which is the first time it's happened in the history of the world. And it is right smack where it said it would be in the Bible, the bridle of the white horse, Pegasus, in the constellation Aquarius. So how exciting is that? That's the first time in the history of the world that something written in the Bible has actually manifested itself. And where would it happen? In the stars. Because that's why. Because it says in the first page of the Bible, let the stars be for signs. So the signs of this new consciousness, this revolution in thinking, this revolution in life, this, this communion with nature and with animals and with life and, and the restoration of women and all of these magnificent things. Where's the sign in the stars? Where in Pegasus the white horse has appeared? Behold the white horse. And so uh, <laughs> this is, this is a, a beautiful time for you in spite of the snow, a beautiful time because you have discovered something. And, and this, what you have heard this morning about Pegasus, and when I send this to you, is, you'll see, but millions haven't the slightest idea. The scientists know they've seen this, but they don't really connect it to this. That's not their job, and I understand that. I, I, I've, talked to, I've written to scientists about Jesus saying, if your eye be single, your body will fill with light, knowing that the single eye of the pineal gland secretes melatonin. But when I write to them, they never write back. Because that's not, they can't get involved in opening a Bible, oh my God. I understand that, but that's my job to tell them. I've written to 71 churches so far. I have to tell them about Pegasus. Why? I, I, I write them right back. I don't expect you, I'm a new age teacher. I don't expect you to write me back. I don't, I'm not arguing, I'm just telling I have a responsibility because inside of me it was said, tell these people this. Why? Because they're going to think, I think I'm a nut anyhow, but why? Because when it happens, they'll know, they were told. They'll know. And, and then, like what Debbie called me this morning, all of a sudden, here you have this big minister in Fort Lauderdale with thousands of people, and all of a sudden, what's he doing? He's using the exact same pictures that we used when we did the Zodiac in the Bible, the exact same ones. And, and you, naming the same stars, Mark, Kevin, all of the stars. Well, whatever. <laughs> whatever. But I'm not going to send him the Pegasus thing, because he, then, then he'll say, oh, I discovered this. No. But, 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 but that, wouldn't be, that wouldn't be a problem anyhow, because the greater good is that people know. And that's what she was saying. If he can get to thousands or millions of people and I can't, then he should know. I just want to add something. Okay, um, then we're going to go. That's the end of that. About yes. six months ago. Uh, Turn around and see uh, you. About six months ago, the book that came to me for the older uh, children in church is titled The Universe, okay? Mm. And the lessons that they've been having for the last six months are all on cosmic law. Right. That's what they've been learning for the last six months, it's all cosmic law. That's excellent. Yeah. Well, see, that, that's, what's, that's, what's, that's, what you, that's what you missed, and that's what I missed, and that's what we all missed. We weren't taught. I wasn't taught anything. I was taught as a little kid that I was a worthless, rotten sinner. <laughs> and I was lined up in his mama's place. You know, it was one of these churches where if you close the door, you'd hear it echo through the whole place. Boom, 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 boom. And you stand in this stone place and waiting for this guy sitting in this dark closet to slide the board back and say, boy, am I rotten. How old are you? I'm seven. What do I know? I'm rotten. And he's the guy that's rotten. He should have actually been praying to me. He's out messing around, and I'm saying I'm guilty. <laughs> but that's how screwed up we, we get. How screwed up we get. Well, there's other stuff, but it's, uh, I want you to get home or wherever you go. We're, we're going to get something to eat. We're not going to go home. Don't go home. Don't allow people, don't allow nature to stop you. Take caution. But you have to flow with it. Flow with it. <laughs> the street, they're going to plow the street. Stay driving. You just drive slower. But don't allow yourself to be subdued by anything. That's where people get in a lot of trouble. Incidentally, you weren't here a little early. I was telling people about, I have this new, you know, the CD-ROM. 
I went on Webster's and they talked about an animal called Tuatara, T-U-A-T-A-R-A. A greenish lizard has a spiny crest. On the top of its head is the pineal body or third eye linked to the brain. Did you ever see those things with that one lizard with that one eye and it can go this way or that way? Pineal, pineal body. Well, I that's pretty good. All right, I just threw that in. A lot, of, a lot of good stuff. We could go on and on and on, and I would. I would really go on, because I, I love to have just a few people, because it's interesting, because like we, we could give a change. I'd much rather have that, but um, you know, you might get out of here. We might not be able to open the door. We may be here for a while, so we, we could do a whole book. <laughs> we may be here for good. Okay, thanks. We'll see you. Bye-bye.